Lewis maintains that, that high-frequency traders are front-running smaller investors, in his, in his words. Legal front-running is how he puts it. Yeah, they are. I mean, there's no question about it. They, you know, they know that if you go to the store every day to get a Snickers bar, well, if I run to the store first, get a little bit of a discount, and then sell you your Snickers bar, you know, they're going to make a little bit of money, especially if they do it millions of times. And so, you know, it, it's almost like the Soz Bandits, where you take advantage of, of a regulation that's not quite right. You know, it, it, it's what they do, and they've been doing it for a long time, and it's reality. But I don't think that's even the greatest risk. Until the New York Times article broke in July 2009, high-frequency trading was a little-known secret outside the financial sector. The strategy leverages powerful computers and trading algorithms to transmit millions of trades at speed faster than you can blink. At its peak, high-frequency trading firms accounted for nearly 73% of all equity trading volume in the United States. These trades were so profitable that in 2009, a 40-year-old hotshot trader dug a nearly straight 825-mile-long fiber optic cable from Chicago to New York connecting America's top two financial centers in lightning speed. But how did high-frequency trading start? Why was it kept in the dark by Wall Street for so long? Why would anyone move mountains to build an 800-mile-long cable? And what were their stories? What are the controversies and future of high-frequency trading? We will go through all that in this video. Stay tuned. High frequency trading is all about increasing the speed at which information travels. The phenomenon of fast information delivery dates all the way back to the 19th century. In 1815, the combined forces of Britain and Prussia defeated Napoleon's army at the Battle of Waterloo. Legend has it that, before the dust even settled on the battlefield, a carrier pigeon was on its way across the British Channel to London, delivering the result of the battle to Nathan Rothschild. Informed ahead of the other traders, Rothschild made a killing shorting French bonds. Financial markets have moved far beyond carrier pigeons. In 1981, Michael Bloomberg launched the world's first computerized system to provide real-time price feedback as a general partner at Solomon Brothers, which is at the time one of the largest investment banks on Wall Street. Then, the real opportunity for high-speed trading took place in 1998. With the intent to open the stock markets to anyone with a desktop computer, the SEC authorized electronic exchanges and paved the way for the full-bloom start of high-frequency trading. But as new marketplaces emerge, PCs have been unable to compete with Wall Street's supercomputers. The supercomputers spot trends and execute trades faster than other investors could blink, changing orders and strategies within milliseconds. By 2010, the trading speed has shrunk to microseconds and subsequently nanoseconds in 2012. To stay ahead of competition, a Wall Street trader named Daniel Spivy pulled off a real-life Mission Impossible and proved forever that if there's a will, there's a way. Many high-frequency traders use software to make rapid trades and exploit tiny differences in price of financial assets such as stocks and future contracts. For example, Traders could buy a stock for a dollar in Chicago and sell it at a dollar and a cent in New York if they could beat the speed at which price synchronizes between the two exchanges. Do this over a million times a day and you can generate very sound returns at no risk. This is called price arbitrage and arbitrage opportunities disappear quickly since they're basically free money. To get there first, you need lightning fast internet connection and every millisecond counts. A millisecond is a thousandth of a second. According to research, a blink of an eye on average takes 300 to 400 milliseconds. That is approximately one third of a full second. But compared to the speed of information, a blink of an eye is eternity. The great financial centers of Chicago and New York are 800 miles apart and it takes only 16 milliseconds for information to travel between the two cities through internet cables. But that's a long time in the life of a high-frequency trader. Daniel Spivey was born in Jackson, Mississippi and earned his trading chops at the Chicago Board Options Exchange. He became one of the exchange's first remote market makers in 2005 
when he set up shops in his hometown to trade options for the S&P 500 index. In 2007, Speedy contracted with the New York hedge fund to devise a trading strategy where the fund would search out tiny discrepancies between future contracts in Chicago and their underlying equities in New York. Spivey composed the program, but he couldn't execute as he demanded screaming internet speed between New York and Chicago. There was no real options on the table for him. In his frustrations, Spivey decided to think differently and spend 10 months researching the feasibility of building a new and faster fiber optic cable, which is made of clear glass so that information can travel incredibly fast at about two-thirds the speed of light. The project he had in mind will value speed at all cost. Instead of bouncing from city to city like the current solutions, he is determined to build a straight cable to shorten the physical distance and gain an edge on speed. With blueprints ready to roll, Speedy approached Jim Barksdale, who also resides in Jackson, Mississippi after a successful career as CEO at AT&T Wireless and Netscape, a company that created the JavaScript programming language. Barksdale's success and personal connections in technology and telecom makes him a perfect investor for Speedy's little project. They immediately went on the road and started engaging with county leaders, highway commissions, and private landowners to propose their plan. By March 2009, construction crews started drilling straight through the massive Allegheny Mountains in Pennsylvania, avoiding some much easier but slightly further routes. The entire project went on in secrecy to fend off competition until its nearly completion. The project cost around an eye-popping $300 million to build, and what's the end result? Standing at 825 miles and 13.3 milliseconds, the hyper optic cable network they built shoves 100 miles and beats the previous record routes by 3 milliseconds. That is close to eternity in the world of a high frequency trader. All the big quant trading houses such as Wolverine and New York banks such as Goldman Sachs and UBS signed up at once. The first 20 traders to sign up and use this cable spent a combined $2.8 billion. It's truly amazing how much 3 milliseconds are worth. is watching and they're seeing these big negative Thanks, numbers Lewis. and their confidence gets affected. They are ping-ponging back off each other. People are seeing this and those memories of fear are coming back. Trading at 60. What the heck is going on down here? Uh, I don't know. All of a sudden here we started hearing screaming bye bye bye. Now we're sitting down 875 points. We've now broken uh, Dow 10,000. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped more than 900 points. The market didn't work. It broke down. The machines broke down. Fear came back into the market in a very big way. High frequency traders brought themselves massive public scrutiny when the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P 500, and Nasdaq plunged 9% within minutes on May 6, 2010. Then, within just 20 minutes, they quickly bounced back and recovered a large part of that loss. The dramatic turning of events was recognized as the second largest intraday point swing at the time. This is the infamous flash crash that many pointed to the inner workings of high frequency trading. On April 21, 2005, nearly five years following the incident, the US Department of Justice laid 22 criminal counts including market manipulation charges against the vendor Sin Sark, a London-based trader who placed orders of thousands of S&P 500 futures with the intention to cancel later. These orders amounted to $200 million worth of bets that the market would go down, but were then replaced or modified 19,000 times before they were canceled. The strategy is called spoofing, and is now banned across the US. Saro is not the only case. In fact, there has been a number of cases and fines targeting high-frequency trading firms in recent years. In October 2013, regulators fined Net Capital $12 million for trading malfunctions that led to its collapse. In July 2014, Quant Fund Citadel was fined for $800,000 for a violation that included quote stuffing. Another strategy now widely banned. And more recently, in 2009, Tower Research Capital was ordered to pay $67.4 million to the CFTC 
to settle allegations of spoofing, which, as we mentioned, was also banned. Ever since the flash crash incident in 2010, regulators have been applying heavy pressures on high-frequency traders. In fact, many, including Nobel Prize winning economist Michael Spence, believes that high-frequency trading should be banned altogether. So if high-frequency trading causes so much trouble, and in many cases associated with illegal market behaviors, why the hesitation? On the flip side and on the other side of the bridge, many people in the financial industry claim that high-frequency trading, although for-profit, improves market liquidity and narrows the bid offer spread. This makes trading and investing cheaper for smaller investors like you and I. The topic has become such a constant point of debate on both sides as evidence of the good and bad emerged to center stage. The general sentiment seems to be that high frequency trading does bring certain benefits but it needs to be regulated and reformed. Many advocates such as the CFA Institute propose reforms including more robust internal risk management measures, more transparencies and disclosures to the market. As it stands now, the debate will last for a while and there will be new reforms taking place. So stay tuned on that. Remember our story of the 825 mile long cable that lets information travel at two thirds the speed of light? It turns out that we could go even faster. Based on the laws of physics, the only thing that's faster than two thirds the speed of light is, well, the full speed of light. Enter microwave data transmission. The technology comes from research in the 90s to gather images from outer space, which has since been adapted to point to point transmission back on Earth. It shoots a later beam from one point to another, reaching speed close to the speed of light. Microwave data transmission is already implemented by traders from New York to Chicago and transmits information in merely 4 milliseconds, which is way faster than Speedy's project. The downside, however, is that microwave transmission have limited bandwidth and are not that reliable. To end this video, something needs to be said about technology. In many ways, great ideas are generated in many of the most unlikeliest corners of our world, and great products are delivered in the most unlikeliest fashion. Somewhere in the world, there's always people who are not happy with the status quo and looks for another way, another edge. For all of its faults and flaws, high frequency trading is driving technological innovations to the extreme. Spivy's 825 mile long mountain drilling project might go down in history just as a service that benefited the few and benefited the wealthy. But the will for making the impossible possible is exactly how great products are delivered. This is About Value. I'm your host, David. Till next time. Peace.